All right, thank you everyone for joining us this evening for the Get the Dirt on Your Soil uh, webinar series. Um, tonight we have our first speaker, uh, Becky LeBoy, who's the Education and Outreach Specialist with the Ocean County Soil Conservation District, who is talking to us tonight with her presentation, Don't Treat Your Soil Like Dirt. So I've said the D word dirt twice so far, and that makes it three times, but I will do our best to not say it tonight because it is soil and not the D word. Thank you again for everyone joining us this evening. My name is Steve Yerjo, and I'm the county agent um, with Ocean and Atlantic counties uh, for Rutgers Co-op Extension. <clears throat> and we have been putting on um, these webinar series, obviously because of the current situation that we're we're going through. But we really appreciate everyone taking the time to um, enjoy and participate in these educational opportunities. Um, as I mentioned before, we are recording um, these webinars. We will get you information in the next day or so about how to be able to access them uh, online so you can uh, review them at your leisure or to review some of the information that you may miss or you have questions on. Um, if you do have any questions, we are asking that um, you either put them in the chat or in the Q&A feature. And if you are someone who has regularly been coming to the webinars that we've been hosting, uh, both ourselves, Jersey Friendly Yards, Ocean County so Soil Conservation District, and Rutgers University, um, you are able to get there um, by the buttons that are at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can either use the chat, which looks like a cartoon word bubble. Um, just press on that, and you should have it appear on the right side of your screen. Or you can use the Q&A feature, which should be on the right uh, bottom of your screen as well. Um, if you don't see it in the row of buttons, you can click the button that has three smaller dots in it to extend your choices. So you should be able to get in there. Um, I will be monitoring the, the question and answers um, and the ch chat. Um, we are going to hold all questions towards the end of, of, of the talk tonight so that Becky will get through her presentation. She may even answer some of your questions by the time she gets to her later slides. But we are very excited to have Becky LeBoy, the Education Outreach Specialist from the Ocean County Soil Conservation District here tonight to talk to us about um, not treating our soil like dirt. One fun fact that I just want to mention is that the soil conservation districts are um, regional or county based. So there are some that cover a couple of different counties, but they are found throughout the whole state of New Jersey and they do have some jurisdiction over it. But there is only one education outreach specialist and we are fortunate enough to have her in the southeastern part of the state in Ocean County. So um, I know that Becky is knowledgeable about all things soil. So I will just hand it on over to Becky and thank you again for participating tonight. Go ahead, Becky. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and get started. All right. So good evening, everyone. My name is Becky LeBoy, and I'm the Education Outreach Specialist with Ocean County Soil Conservation District. And a special thanks to Dr. Steve Yerjo for inviting me to present this program. Don't treat your soil like dirt. So in case you're not familiar with a soil district, let me share a little bit about what it is and why it exists. Uh, you may be familiar with the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, which lasted about a decade and is sometimes referred to uh, as the Dirty 30s. And this was a period of drought and severe dust storms. And by decades of extensive mismanaged farming and agricultural practices, uh, the Farmers in that era did not know or understand the importance of crop rotation or cover crops to manage soil fertility. The deep plowing of the topsoil had killed the natural vegetation that normally kept the soil in place and trapped moisture, even during dry periods and high winds. And they overgrazed uh, the Western Plains and stripped it of virtually all other cover. And as a result, the soil dried up and turned to dust and soon blowing in large dark clouds across the plains and even across the entire country and even reaching the east coast so congress realized that the loss of soil and i'll, I'll quote is a menace to the national welfare unquote and it directed the secretary of agriculture at the time 
to establish the Soil Conservation Service, the SCS, as a permanent agency in the United States Department of Agriculture. And in 1994, Congress changed the SCS name to the Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, to better reflect the broad and scope of the agency's concerns, which now include water and natural resource conservation efforts. And the Ocean County Soil Conservation District originated in 1952 and is one of 15 soil conservation districts in New Jersey that all work together to implement the New Jersey Soil Erosion and Sediment Control Act which governs various aspects of new development and soil disturbance. And Ocean County Soil Conservation District is a subdivision of the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. However, it is locally governed and operates within the boundaries of Ocean County. And as Steve mentioned, your county has a soil district as well. And I encourage you to find out which one it is. Ocean County Soil Conservation District has also developed an education program designed to bring awareness about the importance of natural resources and their conservation and to promote environmental stewardship throughout the Barnica Bay watershed, whose ecological boundaries share almost exactly the same footprint as Ocean County's political boundaries. So partnerships and combined efforts with agencies such as the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, the Barnegat Bay Partnership, our National Estuary Program, and Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Ocean County have served to enhance our education efforts. And I love my job. And two of my favorite responsibilities include offering educational programs to both adults and children and to work with our Barnegat Bay Partnership colleagues. And we install and promote native plant demonstration gardens with the goal of inspiring others to implement conservation practices at home. And so your role, if you are a native plant gardener, and I'm guessing that we have a lot of gardeners with us tonight, is a really important and fun way for you to be an environmental steward within your community. So think about this question. What is at the root of your garden or landscape? Well, healthy soil, that's our goal. And healthy gardens start with healthy soil. In fact, healthy soil is at the root of all life on Earth. And today's program is titled, Don't Treat Your Soil Like Dirt. And if there's one thing that you take away from this program, I hope that it will be a renewed appreciation and understanding of your soil. So soil is and should be the gardener's friend. So get to know your soil, treat it with kindness and understanding, and you and your garden will be rewarded because healthy soil is at the root of our planet, planet Earth. So I've mentioned the words healthy soil a few times already. So only living things can have health. So viewing soil as a living ecosystem reflects a fundamental shift in the way we care for our planet's soil and the life that depends on it. Soil is not an inert growing medium, but rather it's teeming with life that provides the foundation of a very elegant symbiotic ecosystem. Soil is an ecosystem that can be managed by gardeners to perform five essential functions. To sustain plant and animal life, both above and below the surface, by providing a diverse physical, chemical, and biological environment for the exchange of water, nutrients, energy, and air. Soil can regulate the distribution of rain or irrigation between infiltration and runoff 
and soil regulates the flow and the storage of water and solutes, which include nitrogen, phosphorus, pesticides, and other nutrients and compounds dissolved in water. And with proper and healthy functioning, soil partitions water for groundwater recharge and for use by plants and soil animals. Soil acts as a filter to protect the quality of water, air, and other resources. Toxic compounds or excess nutrients can be degraded by soil or otherwise made unavailable to plants and animals. Soil manages nutrient cycling. Soil stores and moderates the release of and the cycling of nutrients. And during biogeochemical processes, nutrients can be transformed into plant available forms, held in the soil to be utilized by plants or even lost to air or water. And soil has the ability to maintain its porous structure to allow passage of air and water, withstand erosive forces, and provide a medium for plant roots. And soil provides support for human structures and protects archeological treasures. Soil has had an intimate relationship with all other natural resources on our planet for billions of years. Soil interacts with both living and non-living resources from basic elements such as carbon and oxygen to sunlight, rocks and minerals, and water, bacteria, fungus, microorganisms, macroorganisms, animals, plants, and humans. Soil is an integral and essential part of Earth's processes and systems, including the water cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, temperature and climate, ocean currents, solar energy systems, electrical systems, magnetic forces, and on and on. Soil is at the root of all life on Earth. Soil is formed by five major factors. Parent material, the primary materials, which all soils, from which all soils are formed, Climate, temperature and moisture affects rates of biological activity and chemical reactions. Topography and relief. The location of a soil in a landscape can affect how climatic processes impact it. Organisms. Each soil has a unique combination of microbes, plants, animals, and humans acting upon it. And new soils increase in depth through deposition of minerals and organic matter. Time, all of the other factors assert themselves over a period of time, hundreds and thousands of years. Layers in the soil called horizons show the development of soil over time. The influence of each of these five major factors varies from place to place, but the combination of all five factors will determine the kind of soil developing in any given place at any given time. So the formation of soil in New Jersey is quite diverse based on our geographic location. And that's because our state's geologic history is quite diverse. 
So if you've seen any of my previous programs, you've probably seen this map before. And you may know that New Jersey is divided into four physiographic provinces. So a physiographic province is a geographic region with distinct landscape characteristics, and it's termed geomorphology, geo meaning earth and morph meaning form. And these regions share commonly distinct rock types and other geologic features. Many physiographic provinces are further subdivided into subregions and are commonly associated with specific ecological communities. So New Jersey has the Ridge and Valley in the north, the Highlands, the Piedmont, and the Coastal Plain. So next time you join our program, instead of asking you what county or town you're from, we're going to ask you what physiographic province you're from. So you can see on this map of the geologic history of New Jersey, how the boundaries of the physiographic regions overlap with different rock formations. And the parent materials of New Jersey soil comes from formations of rocks caused by orogeny, which is the folding of the Earth's crust, as well as pressure and heat. So the Ridge and Valley, if you're from the Ridge and Valley, it formed around 500 million years ago through orogeny mountain building. And it's composed of conglomerate, sandstone, quartzite, and slate, which resist erosion, allowing for the high elevations, and also shale and limestone, which easily erode, creating the valleys. And those of you from the highlands, you can identify yourself to Steve. The Highlands is our most ancient province formed during the Precambrian era between 1 billion and 750 million years ago. So melting and recrystallization of sedimentary rocks were deeply buried, subject to pressure and high temperatures, creating metamorphic rocks such as granite, gneiss, schist, and marble. And the granites and the gneiss resist erosion and create highlands. And then belts of exposed sedimentary rock weathered to create valleys and streams. And those of you from the Piedmont here tonight, the Piedmont is a series of faults. Well, rather a series of faults actually separate the Piedmont from the highlands. And then sedimentary sandstone, shale, and conglomerate, they create a broad lowland interlaced with igneous basalt and diabase, which create ridges and uplands formed during the Jurassic and Triassic ages. And then finally, the coastal plain, and that's where I live. This province consists of sediment, which ranges in age from the Cretaceous period to the Holocene epoch, which is between 135 million years ago to the present sediment consisting of quartzite sand, clay, green sand marl, and gravel are deposited as the ocean undergoes transition, transgression and regression, which is rising and falling. So these physiographic provinces are not confined to our state, whereas the state of New Jersey is defined by political boundaries the rock formations, <clears throat> which is the parent material of soil, is defined by geological boundaries. So although New Jersey is a small state, our geology is very diverse because we are situated at the confluence of several physiographic provinces. So look to the map on the right, and it shows the boundaries of the physiographic provinces of the New York Bight watershed. And the coastal plain actually extends up through Long Island. And the Piedmont, which is the red colored area, begins just to the north of New Jersey and extends southwest. The highlands, which is the gray colored area, starts just south of New Jersey and extends to the north throughout New England. And the Ridge and Valley, it cuts through the northwest portion of New Jersey. And then here's another look at the same physiographic provinces showing their southerly extensions. 
And these provinces extend in a northeast to southwest direction all the way down the coast. And here you can see that the coastal plain extends from South Jersey, again, starting from Long Island, down through Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. And in fact, this physiographic region extends down to Florida and around to Texas. And the gray colored Piedmont, Piedmont province, if you recall, uh, which started just to the north of New Jersey, extends down into Alabama. The highlands is that mint green sliver termed New England on this map. And it begins just to the west of New Jersey in Pennsylvania. And recall it continues and expands up through New England. And then the Ridge and Valley province is a thin strip that cuts through the northwestern portion of our state from New York and continues down into Alabama. So this variety of parent material, the influence of different time periods, the different microclimates within each province, and the fact that New Jersey is situated in the northernmost portion or the southernmost portion of three out of four of the provinces, this all lays the foundation for a variety of soils and therefore a diversity of vegetation. So not to mention the Pine Barrens that sits in the middle of the coastal plain is in and of itself also very unique with its own unique soils, climate, um, hydrological patterns or water patterns and unique vegetation. Here's a map of the physiographic provinces of the United States using very broad strokes, but it offers a glimpse into our country's geology and parent material of all of our soils. So I encourage you to explore physiographic regions if this type of thing interests you. Obviously it interests me and I really enjoy looking at these maps. So let's explore the physical, chemical, and biological components and processes that support healthy soil, a healthy landscape, and a healthy ecosystem. So physical soil processes affect plant growth, plant diversity, root proliferation, organism movement, organic matter content, tillage, aeration, water storage and movement, resistance to erosion, and compaction. And examples of soil uh, properties, physical soil properties, include soil composition, texture, structure, and color. So, what is soil? What is the composition of soil? So by volume, soil is 25% air, 25% water, between 45 and 47% minerals, and between three and 5% organic matter. So almost 50% of soil is loose, unconsolidated mineral and organic matter. And the other 50% of soil is composed of pore space, which holds water and air in varying amounts at any given time. So soil that has more air space than water is dry. And think of the dry sandy pine barrens. And soil that has more water than air filling the pore space is wet. So think of swamps and bogs. So let's take another look at the organic matter component. So organic matter, remember that little sliver? Although least an overall percentage is necessary for all soil function. So actively decomposing organic matter, which is that purple slice of the pie, and stabilized organic matter, meaning organic matter that has been completely decomposed, which is called humus, and that's the yellow slice of the pie, they make up the bulk of 
organic matter. And then fresh plant and animal residue makes up about 10% of organic matter <clears throat> and living organisms make up less than 5% of organic matter. However, their contribution to healthy soil is enormous as we will discuss. So the organic matter is so very important to soil health because it provides food and shelter for soil microbes. It provides pore space. It promotes soil aggregation. It promotes storage and recycling of nutrients for plant use. It improves soil structure. It increases something called cation exchange capacity, which we'll talk more about later. And it increases filtration and water holding capacity. In fact, organic matter holds 18 to 20 times its weight in water. And organic matter supports not only the physical properties of soil, but also biological and chemical processes. So these processes are always changing and it is in their synergy that allows soil to function at its greatest environmental potential. And soils that support all three processes, physical, chemical, and biological, are more resilient in times of natural disasters, such as flooding and extreme weather events. So I'll talk more about all these processes as we continue. So parent material is rock made of specific ingredients, minerals that break down over time, combining with organic matter, air and water, creating soil. And I already talked a lot about parent material when I introduced the four physiographic provinces of New Jersey. So as parent material is broken down into smaller mineral components, the components are of different sizes. So the size of the mineral in the soil gives the soil its texture. That's called soil texture. So depending on the size of the grain, the texture can be either sand, silt, or clay. And gravel, which is greater than two millimeters is not considered soil. Sand is between two millimeters and 0 0.05 millimeters, and each particle can be seen with the naked eye. So sand particles are just small enough to hold some water, but most of its gravitational water drains out, leaving lots of air within the pore space and only a little capillary water meaning water that can move upwards against gravity. Because sand particles are influenced by gravity, they will settle out when mixed with water. And soil with sand particles feels gritty when ground between your fingers. Silt is between 0 0.05 millimeters and 0 0.002 millimeters. You will need a microscope to see individual silt particles. And like sand, these particles consist of weathered rock, only much smaller in diameter. And the pore spaces between silt particles are much smaller in size and hold a lot more capillary water than sand. And particles of silt are also influenced by gravity and will settle out when mixed with water. And the texture of silt when rubbed between your fingers is that of flour. And clay is less than 0 0.002 millimeters. And clay can be formed during intense hydrothermal activity or by chemical action, such as what's called carbonic acid weathering of silicate bearing rocks. And clay particles are readily distinguished from silt, but this time an electron microscope is needed to see them. 
So clay particles are considered plastic. They have what's called plasticity. So they can be molded and altered when wet. And they feel somewhat slippery when rubbed between your fingers. And this is because clay particles absorb and hold lots of water. And when they dry out, they lose their plasticity. So to offer a size comparison between the different texture sizes, if a clay particle were the size of a marigold seed, a silt particle would be the size of a large radish, and a sand particle would be the size of a large garden wheelbarrow. So you might be asking what difference does texture make? Well, the size of the particles has everything to do with their surface area and the surface area of the pore spaces between individual particles. So clay has tremendous surface area compared to sand. And clay has smaller pore spaces between particles, but many more pore spaces in total. And in addition, organic matter is comprised of very, very minute particles that just like clay, they have lots of surface area. And that's important because plant nutrients can attach, preventing them from leaching out of the soil. But sand particles are too big to hold on to nutrients, which then easily leach out of sandy soil. So soil can be either all sand, all silt, or all clay, or it can be a mixture, which you know as loam. And as a soil, it of course includes the pore spaces that hold air and water, as well as the organic matter. So because the particles, sand, silt, and clay, react differently with gravity and water, you can do what's called a jar test to determine the texture of your garden soil. So fill a jar about halfway with a small sample of your soil, add water, shake, and then let it settle for two days. And the largest particles, including sand, will quickly fall to the bottom. Silt will react with the water and remain suspended for a few hours, but will be the next layer to settle out. And the clay particles will initially bond with the water molecules and will stay suspended for one or two days. But once they settle out, the clay particles will be your top layer. And when your water looks clear, you can determine the approximate percentage of sand, silt, and clay based on the height of each of your layers. And you can then use the soil texture pyramid to determine the type of soil you have or the texture of soil you have. So for example, this jar has a soil sample showing approximately 55% sand, 40% silt, and 5% clay. So this combined percentage equals a sandy loam soil texture. That's where that yellow dot is marking <clears throat> the soil texture pyramid. So in the bottom center of the soil texture pyramid, which is colored brown, is a location named loam. And this is traditionally the sweet spot for plants and for gardeners. So traditionally, and I'm, I'm making air quotes, good, uh, which is a relative term, good garden soil is composed of approximately a range of between 22 and 52 percent sand, 28 and 50 percent silt, and 8 and 28 percent clay, plus of course <clears throat> organic matter. So those of us living in the coastal plain like myself will most likely have soil that occupies that left corner of the soil texture pyramid being mostly sand, or perhaps you are living in an area of the coastal plain with more clay. Um, whether you have sand, silt, or clay, or a mixture of in your garden, it doesn't mean you don't have good soil. 
So the first step for you to, is to know the, the properties or characteristics of your particular soil and then find the plants that thrive in these conditions. So when the sand, silt, and clay particles combine together, they take on shape and they form clusters that we call aggregates. And they're held together by organic matter, water, and secretions from plants, animals, and other microbes in the soil. And the pore spaces between the aggregates provide places for retention and exchange of air and water. And optimum aggregates have a wide range in pore size distribution. So this includes large and medium sized pores between the aggregates and smaller pores within the aggregates themselves. And the way that the aggregates are arranged is referred to as soil structure. So soil scientists uh, recognize seven structure types um, and two what we call structureless types, including the single grain and the massive. So aggregates are bound together or torn apart by physical, chemical, and biological processes. So for example, soil particles are pushed together by changing temperatures, including freezing and thawing, as well as drying. And plant roots also push soil particles together and even break them apart. So soil particles are glued together by organic residues exuded by fungi and bacteria and by sugars excreted from plant roots. And fungal hyphae in plant roots stabilize aggregates. So the amount of clay and humus influences soil structure. Soil fauna, small animals, and human activity also influence soil structure. And the key to good soil structure in the garden is organic matter and plant roots. So if you wish to optimize your soil structure, whether you have sandy soil or clay soil, add organic matter and plant a diverse array of native species to interact with the native soil fauna. So the last physical characteristic we'll cover is soil color. So your soil's color is based on the mineral and organic components. So soil color is also influenced by physical, chemical, and biological processes taking place in the soil. So a healthy gardening soil will typically be a dark brown color, which indicates lots of organic matter. And soil scientists use soil color to describe and determine soil type based on the Munsell system. So this system uses hue, which is a specific color, value, which is lightness and darkness, and chroma, which is color intensity, <clears throat> excuse me, that are arranged in uh, books of color chips. So soil is held next to the chips to get a visual match. And color provides a clue to the mineral content of soil. So the development and distribution of color within a soil profile are part of weathering, the weathering process. So as rocks weather, the mineral elements oxidize. So for example, iron forms small crystals of red or yellowish red and organic matter decomposes into black humus. And both aerobic and anaerobic environments also influence soil color. And then something called electron exchanges between bacteria and nutrients can also influence soil color. So let's talk about biological processes. Soil is alive, it's a living system. 
So soil microbes and soil macroorganisms naturally suppress pests. They decompose organic matter and convert it, uh, convert unusable forms of nutrients into forms that plants can use while creating a soil that's porous and permeable. So increased consumption of nutrients by soil organisms prevents leaching and keeps the nutrients available to plants. And the byproducts left behind by these organisms act as a soil glue that increases aggregation. Thereby, it increases infiltration and prevents erosion. So just as we need biodiversity in our above ground ecosystems, diversity of soil organisms keeps the soil ecosystem functioning at optimum health. So one cup of healthy soil, one cup of healthy soil contains 200 billion bacteria, 1 million meters of fungi, 20 million protozoa, 100,000 nematodes, 50,000 arthropods, and one earthworm. So bacteria are single-celled organisms that feed on other organisms in the soil and decompose their organic matter. Uh, some bacteria fix nitrogen, providing plants with what might be an otherwise unavailable nutrient. Bacteria enhance soil structure, improve water infiltration and water holding ability. They compete with disease causing organisms and filter and degrade pollutants. And before plants can become established on fresh sediments, the bacterial community must establish first, which I find fascinating. So remember, one cup of undisturbed soil has one million meters of fungi. So fungi are multicellular organisms, and you're probably familiar with mushrooms and molds. And yeast is a single-celled fungi. There are many others that live underground in the soil. And they grow as long strands or threads called hyphae, and the hyphae can be several yards long and they push their way through soil particles, past roots and past rocks, and they sometimes group into masses called mycelium. And fungi decompose complex carbon compounds. They improve the accumulation of organic matter. They retain nutrients in soil. They bind soil particles into aggregates, which help increase water infiltration and soil water holding capacity. They compete with plant diseases and they decompose certain types of pollution. So in one cup of soil, there's 20 million protozoa. So protozoa are microscopic. They're single-celled organisms that eat bacteria. So the bacteria contain more nitrogen than the protozoa can utilize. So some is released to plants in the form of ammonium. And protozoa prevent some pathogens from establishing on plants. And they function as a food source for nematodes. So in one cup of soil, there's 100,000 nematodes. And nematodes are small, unsegmented, unsegmented round worms. And they live in tiny water films in the large pore spaces in soil. And they feed on bacteria, fungi, and each other. And then they distribute bacteria and fungi through the soil as they move around. And some do cause some harm by feeding on plant roots, but predatory nematodes consume root feeding nematodes and even prevent their access to the roots. So most kinds of soil nematodes do not parasitize plants. 
but are beneficial in the decomposition of organic matter. And these nematodes are often referred to as free living nematodes. The soil around small plant roots and root hairs is a particularly rich habitat for many kinds of nematodes. So in a cup of soil, there are 50,000 arthropods. So arthropods are small animals such as insects and spiders and mites, and they range in size from microscopic to several inches long. And they live near the surface of the soil, uh, usually up in the upper three inches of the soil. And arthropods improve soil quality by creating structure through burrowing, depositing fecal pellets, controlling disease-causing organisms, and by stimulating microbial activity. They also enhance decomposition by shredding organic matter and mixing it in the soil and by regulating healthy soil food web populations. And one earthworm in a cup of soil. So earthworms feed on organic matter. And the nutrients in the organic matter are, are changed, actually, as they pass through the earthworm's gut. And then the casts are richer in nutrients than the surrounding soil and are in forms that are more available to plants. So the burrows they may create passages for air, for water, and roots, allowing plants to grow deeper roots, which recharges the lower layers of soil with air. And the mucus of the skin of the earthworms, as well as the castings, aid in the formation of soil aggregates. So by increasing the organic matter content in your garden, Earthworms can greatly increase the water holding capacity of soils. So encourage earthworms to come to your yard or garden by adding organic matter. So grass clippings and leaves and compost. And earthworms and other soil organisms are destroyed by tillage. So keep that in mind. And deep and frequent tillage can reduce earthworm populations by as much as 90%. And also chemicals have toxic effects on earthworm populations and other macro invertebrates as well as larger vertebrates. And we certainly don't want these baby robins to be eating poisonous chemicals. So in a typical soil food web, the plants are in control. And why is that? Because plants make their own food from the sun's energy. And food webs start with the plants. So we often think of plants taking up nutrients through root systems and feeding the stems, leaves, or flowers. But a great deal of the energy that results from photosynthesis in the leaves is actually used by plants to produce chemicals that they secrete through their roots. And these secretions are known as exudates. So the rhizosphere, which is an area of interaction between the surface of a plant root and the area surrounding it. So root exudates are in the form of carbohydrates, which are sugars and proteins, which attract and grow specific beneficial bacteria and fungi living in the soil that subsist on these exudates and the cellular material that's slawed off as the plant's uh, root tips grow through the soil. So bacteria and fungi are then eaten by bigger microbes, such as the nematodes and protozoa. The waste secreted by these microbes can be readily absorbed by the plant roots in the rhizosphere, which is the site of root nutrient absorption. And soil life competes for the exudates in the rhizosphere, as well as for the water and mineral content. So each above ground ecosystem 
is supported by a different soil environment, which supports a different set of soil organisms and different food webs. For example, ants are the heavy lifters in the dry, sandy Pine Barrens ecosystem. So picture an earthworm in a dry, sandy environment, it would not survive. So let's talk about soil chemistry. So chemical processes in soil determine nutrient availability. They support nutrient storage and release, promote soil reactions, and relate to something called the cation exchange capacity. So soil contains many nutrients and nutrients have positive or negative charges. And these are called cations and anions. Think way back to your high school chemistry class. So cations hold positive charges and anions hold negative charges. So for example, in this image, you see calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and hydrogen cations. So remember, our smallest particles are clay and humus, and they also carry a charge. Sand is too big to carry a charge. So humus and clay can hang on to nutrients through their charges. So the surface areas of plant root hairs also contain their own electrical charges. So nutrients are absorbed by plants through cation exchanges. So when a plant's, roots, a plant's root hair penetrates the soil, it may exchange its own cations for those mounted on humus or clay particles and absorb the cation nutrient as nourishment. So plant roots use a hydrogen cation for the exchange. They eject one hydrogen cation for every cation nutrient absorbed, and this keeps the charge in balance. So this is kind of the way that plants eat. And the area within the rhizosphere where these cation exchanges take place is called a cation exchange site. And the number of exchange sites determines the capacity of soil to hold nutrients. And this is called the soil's cation exchange capacity, CEC. So soil pH, what is it? So pH measures acidity and alkalinity. So pH is an abbreviation for the power of hydrogen. And the P of pH lets us know that the scale is logarithmic or that instead of counting one, two, three, it would be like counting one, 10, 100, et cetera. And the H tells the concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution being measured. So on a scale of one to 14, the center of the scale seven is neutral and is based on the number of ions present in pure water. So each step to the left of the seven shows an increase by 10 times in the number of hydrogen ions present. So a pH of one would be very acidic, like battery acid. And each step to the right shows a decrease in the number of hydrogen ions present. So a pH of 14 would be very alkaline or basic. <clears throat> so if we take an example of water, H2O, we know that the water has two hydrogens for every one oxygen per molecule, but a very tiny percentage of those molecules have broken up into hydrogen ions, H positive, and hydroxide ions, OH negative. So when the hydrogen ions outnumber the hydroxide ions, the solution is acidic. And when the hydroxide ions outnumber the hydrogen ions, the solution is alkaline or basic. So why is it important to know your soil's pH? Because soil pH affects the availability of nutrients in your soil for plants. 
So the goal pH uh, is usually between 6.5 and 6.8. That's kind of the soil uh, sweet spot. And it's where most nutrients are available and where plants and soil organisms do best. So notice how nitrogen availability begins to drop off when the pH hits about 5.5 and the impacts on phosphorus when pH is about 6. So the best way to buffer your soil pH is, take a guess, add organic matter. Add organic matter to your soil. However, some plants, as we know in New Jersey, prefer and require a certain pH, like more acidic soil. So it's important to not only know your soil's pH, but also know your plant's pH preferences. And plants that lack nutrients that are consumed by animals, including people, will not offer as much nutrients to us browsers. So this chart shows the part of the plant that benefits from different nutrients in the soil, as well as the benefit to animals, including humans. So one of the best things that you can do for your garden is to get your soil tested. And the Rutgers Soil Testing Lab offers homeowners soil test kits where you can collect your own sample and you actually mail it in for testing. Yes, you mail soil through the, through the post office. And there's the website and they are currently open for business. I, I We are very lucky we have Dr. Stephanie Murphy. Um, she is in attendance tonight and she is the uh, director of the Soil Testing Lab. So she can give us all the particulars. Um, I, I do encourage folks to call ahead to find out their status is because of course uh, things may change due to current health con concerns or conditions going on. So to learn how to take a soil sample to send to the lab, I encourage you to visit the Jersey Friendly Yards website which is www.jerseyyards.org and to visit what's called the eight steps to a Jersey friendly yard or Jersey friendly landscape. And then click on step two, start with healthy soil. And this page links to uh, Rutgers website, web page offering a three minute video showing just how to take a soil sample. And then an easy form is also available online at the Rutgers Soil Testing Lab website or call your county's agricultural extension office. And when you send that away with your soil, your test results, will include a very comprehensive assessment of your soil, as well as recommendations for amendments or enhancements based on the types of plants that you plan on planting. And uh, test results can offer information about how to enhance the beauty of your flower garden or productivity of your vegetable garden or your lawn. So that concludes my program about soil and it's 7.59 right on the dot. Of course, I will stick around for questions. So hello there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Becky. Great job. You're very welcome. It's a lot, it's a lot to know about soil and since I have it here and I have everyone's attention, um, this book is my favorite, one of my favorite soil information books. It's called Teeming with Microbes. It's T-E-A, like they're a team, but there's also lots of them. Uh, a Gardener's Guide to the Soil Food Web. It has some really wonderful information about chemical, physical, and biological processes of soil that are easy enough for, for me, 
a common gardener to understand. So uh, Jeff Lowenfels and Wayne Lewis um, are the authors of this book.